Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this uh, Saturday, March 25th from San Antonio. And I'm going to be looking at it from a DraftKings perspective, a daily fantasy perspective. Um, we are going to do a separate video on uh, looking at it from a betting uh, perspective. And as you've seen, uh, it's a completely different approach. It's much more contrarian and, well, we're just looking for different things. You know, and, and when you're doing it from a DFS perspective, you're kind of presuming that the, the Vegas lines and the prop lines are at least somewhat efficient. And you are trying to construct lineups based on those, you know, those presumptions where uh, when you're doing for a betting breakdown, you're presuming that there's something wrong with those lines and you're trying to find some kind of an edge. So we're looking to be a little bit more contrarian when it comes to, um, to attacking for a betting breakdown. So let's take a look at this and we're going to go up from the bottom of the card, fight by fight. And again, what we're looking for here is where we're looking for fighters that that either have a strong inside the distance prop in other words fighters that you know rate to you know finish inside the distance because that's what you're looking for for DraftKings points and in the absence of that or in addition to that we're looking for fighters with with some wrestling upside and and what's what's kind of um I know it's interesting is that it's kind of hard to predict or to project uh, wrestling points because you can make an assessment of it of a style, but though it's it's not exactly predictable um, how the other fighter style is going to coincide. In other words, just because one guy's a wrestler doesn't mean he's necessarily going to be getting a lot of takedowns, especially if he's against somebody who has really good takedown defense. So that component of it does require a lot of um, specific fight knowledge, um, which we we which we are good at, but. Um, it, I, I feel as though that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult because sometimes you think a guy's going to go for takedowns and he just doesn't. When you're relying on a, a fighter uh, engaging in a particular style, now you need, you know, two or three things to happen. You not only need him to win, but you, well, you need him to make the decision to engage in that style. You know what I mean? Like, so if one guy's path to victory is you're, you're betting on it because of his wrestling upside. If he does not opt for that style, you're already kind of fighting a losing battle. So you, you need kind of that parlay of the of the, the fighter with the wrestling upside to, to go for that and for it to be successful. The other thing that you that's kind of difficult when you're playing uh, pure wrestlers is that you're fighting kind of a tough battle um, in, in the with the judges. Um, because, yes, I mean, you are going to amass points from your takedowns, but you are going to need to get that decision victory, um, that 30 points you're just going to have to get. And, and judges have been very, um, I don't want to say cruel, but they don't really favor uh, wrestlers in the decisions. You know, unless you're a wrestler that's going to do a lot of work when you're on top, um, the, the wrestlers that just do takedowns and do nothing um, usually don't get the benefit of the decision. So, that's another line you kind of have to walk. Now, if you are, you know, a finisher that also has takedowns, well, that's obviously, you know, DraftKings gold. And if you have, if you have a wrestler that also engages in a lot of volume, you know, that's kind of like DraftKings gold. But the, just the pure wrestler, um, just going for that decision with the takedown upside, yes, it's 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 in theory, you know, something you want to prefer. But you do run uh, quite a bit of risk when you do that. Uh, nonetheless, let's take a look and we'll, 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 we'll make heads or tails of this card. Um, so first fight, we have Haley Cowan versus Tamaris Vidal. And the first thing that we're going to do, we have to look at the prices. We're going to see if there's any line value. And then we're going to see if there's good inside the distance value. So first of all, you have Haley Cowan, who is about a minus 120 favorite. So we look and drafting should probably price her at about it should price at about 82 versus 8K. Um, and actually, they have Cowan a little bit more expensive than that. So there is like a tiny bit, I guess, of line value in Vidal. If you want to look at it that way. Not that much, but listen, it's certainly something that gets factored into projections and factored into, you know, what you, what you want to do here. Um, the next thing we have to look at is the inside the distance prop. Now, when you're minus 120, or plus 105, you really need to have to be competitive on, say, a, what is the 13 fight card? You need to have an inside the distance prop of about plus 200. You have to have probably at least a 33% likelihood 
to make it, you know, to, to finish. And as it is the case with most women's fights, I don't think we either of them have that. You have Vidal inside the distance is like a plus 400. And Cowan inside, Cowan inside the distance is actually not, oh, that's by decision, sorry. Cowan inside the distance is, is pretty poor also, again, a plus 350. So as far as the inside the distance props, I don't think that either fighter kind of makes the grade. Um, as far as styles go, um, again, it's, it's, you're, 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 you're really speculating here, but you could make the argument that Cowan is the one with the takedown upside. Um, she has engaged in some degree of wrestling. It's also a gymnast, so she has more athleticism. So maybe she'll go for more takedowns. Um, so I guess if there was somebody with the takedown upside, I suppose it would be Cowan. But then again, Cowan has kind of negative line value here. The, the fight seems to be sort of a pass, if you want to know the truth. Now, again, this is DFS, so it's not exactly, that's not exactly the end of the story. If nobody is playing this fight and both these fighters are saying 10% owned, then, you know, it's probably worth it to get some leverage against other fighters in the same price range. Um, but just kind of in a vacuum, neither of these fighters seem to be good DraftKings players. The, the only other case I would make, again, th this is not, this is something you forget about sometimes. You know, playing DFS is not about picking fighters or players. It's about picking and constructing lineups. And, and remember that when you have an 8,200 8K fight, that is a very useful fight in general um, to, you know, to help build your lineups um, because uh, th these these mid-range fighters, they have decent chances of winning, and it opens up salary to, to let you get the higher-priced fighters. Um, so that's why these fights, are you shouldn't completely ignore them. And the other thing about this fight, again, I will kind of make the case for a little bit, is that, again, we're going to get to other fights in that same price range that are going to look a lot better and hence take, you know, a great amount, uh, a great deal more ownership. So, again, there's this is like kind of more advanced uh, – discussion but when you're talking about any leverage in dfs there are several ways to do it number one is getting leverage directly against a popular i guess player fighter whatever sport you're talking about the other is to get leverage um uh against a, cer a certain price range okay so like if, if a lot of people are, are keying on a certain price range of 82 to 88k and you know that bus you'll be able to get leverage on it by playing similar fighters from that price range. So that would be a reason to make the case for this fight in, uh, in MME. Uh, if you're going to build like 50 lineups plus, I think you should definitely get some of this for those reasons. And if you do play this fight, I would not take a particular stand on either one of these girls, because again, um, while Cowan, I guess has more of the wrestling upside, there is some line value in Vidal. So I guess in summary, if you're playing a single entry, you're playing three max, you're playing 20 max, I'd probably avoid this fight. But if you're playing MME, I would definitely get uh, some of it. Uh, what percentage of it? Listen, if I knew that, uh, if I knew that for sure, then then DFS would be broken. Uh, I would say I don't, 10%, something like that. Um, but that's just guessing. If you want, you could run these lineups through Sabersim or some of the better optimizers out there and see when you account for variance and account for upside and things like that and put projections in, then it'll give you an idea of what percent you're supposed to have of these. But I do think that in MME, this is, is this is a kind of a decent fight, but in again, single, single entry, three max, 20 max, whatever, it's probably in a, in a void. I already see where we're headed here. It's probably going to be a longer than usual um, breakdown, but well, that's the way it is. Okay, so you have Venetia Salvador versus Victor Alex Morano. Very sim Okay, so this is going to be interesting to do because the odds are similar. So I want to compare this fight to the Cowan Vidal fight. So you have Salvador's minus 115. So you're expecting something kind of similar as far as price goes. Maybe Salvador 8,200 to 8K for Alex Morano or something like that. And that's what you're getting about 8,300 to 7,900. It, it's, um, it's, it seems about the same um, on both sides. So I don't see that there is any real line value on either side. So we have to go to the inside of the distance props. Now, again, same thing. 
for this particular price range, you're kind of looking at an inside the distance profit target of about plus 200 for either fighter um, or uh, wrestling upside, which we'll get to. So let's just look at these. So first of all, Salvador, his inside the distance prop is actually very strong for the price range. He's, you know, if you account for VIG, about a plus 160, and that's very, very good. So, so we like that. You have Altamirano inside the distance is much weaker. He's like plus 375. So between the two of these, I think it's very clear that Salvador is the better DraftKings play. Um, now, I've heard some narrative that the way the style of this fight is supposed to go is Salvador is like better in round one and Altamirano is going to have more cardio and kind of take over the fight late um, and maybe get a round two, round three finish. While, while that's all well and good, um, again, we're not really going to argue that. We're just going to really go off of these numbers with respect to DFS. We can you can yap about that. When we talk about the betting stuff, but here we're just going to kind of go with this with these presumptions that these odds are right, and basically make Altamirano a much weaker play than Salvador. I mean, for example, I mean I don't see why you would play Altamirano more than say that other fight that we just went over. So let's look at Altamirano compared to, say, Vidal. Even Vidal, well, her by the, inside the distance was much weaker. She was like plus 400. So, so, so Altamirano is better than Vidal. Um, is Altamirano better than Cowan? Cowan inside the distance, yeah. So, okay, so Altamirano, both fighters in that fight are better than both fighters in the women's fight. Um, but... Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I do believe that this fight is going to get significantly more ownership. Um, it's it's a fight that is in that price range that people would like to play because it's comfortable. And especially the Salvador side, I mean, I, I'd like to think that he'd be a really popular play. It certainly looks like a strong play given the metrics. But from what I've what I've seen in 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 the industry over the last couple of days is 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 the majority of the of the action. Um, is coming down on Alta Murano. So if you could actually get Salvador at somewhat low ownership or lower ownership than he should be, um, I think that's really, really strong. Now you should, you, should, you can watch, um, go to truedfs.com uh, and be a sus premium subscriber to get my ownership projections, which are going to be probably put out either later today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow actually. Um, and you'll see where these guys come in, but if Salvador comes in, say, less than 20%, I mean, that's an extremely strong play. So I do think that if we're kind of keeping track of what our, quote, unquote, the, the best plays are, I think we need to start with with Salvador. Um, and I think Altamirano right now is so far the best of the given underdogs. I think it's a better underdog play than Nadal. Um, however... Again, I wonder if if the ownership discount you'll get on Vidal comparing to Altamirano might make up for the fact that Alex Morano is a better play. Well, as I mentioned, like Alex Morano is certainly getting a lot of um a lot. I don't say hype. You know what I mean? I think people are are picking him um at at a rate higher than his win odds suggest, and higher than his DraftKings price or, than his DraftKings uh, potential suggests. So um. Uh, maybe that Cowan would be sort of in a weird way. Not uh, sorry, not Cowan. Vidal would be sort of in a weird way some leverage off of Alton Morano, if that makes any sense. So you play something like, we'll build this from the beginning, something like Salvador and Vidal. I think it's kind of an interesting um, way to get leverage here. Now, again, what's different about this, though, is if you play Salvador, you're already getting leverage against Alton Morano because you're directly against him. Um, so maybe in line us without Salvador, then you could also, then you could play Vidal. You know, and then root for the Salvador one to bust. Okay, um, so it's uh, it's it's interesting. Let's move on to uh, uh, Manuel Torres versus Trey Ogden. So we will look at the uh, let's 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 keep track of this. Um, so these are so far, I think the two best plays, but I think these are going to change. Salvin, uh Torres versus De Silva. So Torres at eighty five hundred versus Ogden at seventy seven hundred. So I'm imagining I'm seeing the Silva, not the Silva, um, Torres at about um very similar to Cowan, right? Like minus 150 or something like that. 
Let's take a look and see. Um, yeah, it sounds, sounds about right. So the line value is nothing special. So we're looking at, at inside the distance props. Now at 8,500, 7,700. Now we need a little bit more of the 8,500. We need something more like maybe a plus 160 or so inside the distance to make that work, okay? And then on the other side, we probably need, again, either wrestling upside or um, maybe a plus 250 or so, plus 260. So that's what we're kind of looking for. So let's take a look at the at the at the information here. So Torres inside the distance is right where you need. I mean, it's not like smash, but it's good. You know, Torres plus 160 is pretty much what you're looking for for this type of price. So that's really not bad. And you look at the Ogden price. Ogden inside the distance is plus 200. And his price seems extremely attractive, actually. Um, so, I mean, look at the difference here. So Torres is plus 160. Ogden is plus 200. So the difference there inside the distance line is not that much, but the price difference, 8,500 to 7,700. I think that you have to regard Ogden as the better play here. Um, and... Also, when we're trying to build this kind of um, this portfolio or this kind of like mock lineup of quote unquote best plays, I think that we can replace Vidal. Well, hold on with Trey Ogden. But the only issue, again, is going to be ownership. So now Trey Ogden not only looks kind of decent as far as the numbers go, but also you are getting a lot of um, of uh, of industry uh, lean towards Ogden. Both in, in in the betting streets, we'll get to that in another video, but also in in DFS. I mean, you're you're hearing a lot of of, of takes that, that that make Trey Ogden a very very live dog, in part because he just won at plus three ten in his last fight, um, so people remember that. So again, he's definitely the strongest so far of these underdogs. I mean, you compare his inside the distance prop to Vidal. I mean, it's it's significantly better, but the ownership is going to be significantly more. So here's here's the here's the million dollar question: What type of ownership gap between Ogden and Vidal is the break even to make them even plays? You know, how much less owner owned does Vidal have to be for you to play her against over Ogden? Well, I have to say that if I knew the answer to that then DFS would be broken. And if DFS, if the if there wasn't a mathematical answer for that, it would be broken. Um, I can say my instinct is that you probably want, you know, at least half the ownership. You know, like if you're going to play Vidal, I would want her to be 10% owned compared to 20% for Ogden. But again, a couple of problems. Number one is I'm guessing, I'm not guessing, I'm making a reasonable presumption reasonable guess but we're not exactly sure what the ownership is going to be i mean we have good projections but we don't know exactly for sure what the ownership is going to be so it's a, it's an inter it's an interesting situation and again this is why again i recommend you know, especially if you're going to go mme you use a you use a a, a tool like saber sim that you could put your ownership projections in and it will actually you know calculate what the impact of the ownership projection is on the upside of your lineup um, which is very, very, I don't, I don't know how they create, calculate that, but it's um, it's an interesting uh, exercise to say the least. So uh, in general, uh, Ogden, I think, is replacing Vidal as the best underdog for now. But let's 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 leave all these guys in. Uh, and 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 Torres, I think uh, Torres is very similar to Salvador with respect to um to being a good player, right? So let's let's compare those. Torres inside the distance plus 160. Hold on. But you had Salvador inside the distance plus 160 at a cheaper price. So I still think that Salvador is a little bit better than Torres, but not by much, you know? Um, so let's put in Salvador, Torres. Well, no, I mean, because then you're playing Torres or Ogden. You have to pick one of these. 
Uh, and that's actually not bad. I do like both of these fighters. So that's one thing you can do. You can play both Ogden and Torres. And you can actually play, I wouldn't I wouldn't say play both Salvador and Altamirano because I do think Salvador is significantly better play than Altamirano. Um, so let's just say for now that we'll put Ogden in. We won't put Torres in. We'll leave Salvador in and we'll leave the doll in for now. Um, and uh, I'm going to reiterate, this is going to be longer than usual. All right, so Preston Parsons versus Kevin Giles. Now, one thing I will say is that before we move on, one thing that that I'm seeing is that it looks as though the first, you know, seven fights on the card or eight fights on the card are the ones you're going to really need to get right. Um, I think this caught. I think that the that the slate is going to be probably somewhat decided by the time we get to these late fights but that's just my opinion but anyway i guess it's not really too particularly relevant so preston parsons is it's about a pick em. so i imagine it should be 81 you know 82 88 k something like that so let's just see what these guys are yeah about that 82 k 8208 k so no real line value either way um Let's take a look again at the inside the distance prop. So again, if it's a pick and fight, you probably want about, I mean, plus 200. Seems like a good target for a good inside the distance prop. Um, now, the other thing I, I forgot to mention is that I, I neglected to talk about whether anybody in these first bunch of fights had like significant wrestling, wrestling upside. The answer is really no. I mean, nobody in either of these fights have a, a real big wrestling upside. Otherwise, I would have mentioned it. Um, uh, on the other hand, let's look at the, look at the Trevin Giles fight. So if you're inside the distance, you have Parsons is plus 220, which is okay. And then you have actually Giles inside the distance is plus 175, which is actually somewhat reasonable. I was not expecting to see something that decent. So, um, yeah, so Giles, on the one hand, Giles probably looks like a good play and maybe a somewhat better play than Parsons. However, however, you have Parsons that has the wrestling upside in this matchup. So I feel as though that these are very, very equal um, propositions here. Um I want to compare just before we lose sight of this, these they're inside the distance props to these others. Um, I still have the, the Salvador fight, the Salvador play being a better play because Salvador's inside this is plus 170, for example. Um, so I do have Salvador better than either of these guys, but doesn't mean you can't play them both. So let's put in, and again, I regard them as exactly equal, Giles and Parsons. So let's put Giles alongside of Salvador. And we still haven't gotten rid of, of Vidal yet, you know, because I wanted to I have Ogden. And since I'm playing Salvador, I'm not playing Alex Murano. So if you're building a lineup like this, I mean, you see what, what building from the middle will do for you. Like it'll give you like the ability to play two 9K guys if you want to. Um, now, again, you're already like pretty contrarian with this Vidal play. I do think Vidal is going to drop off here in a minute, but this is what we're this is what we're trying to accomplish. All right. Um, moving on, we have Steven Peterson versus Lucas Alexander. First, we're looking at the inside uh, the prices. So we have Peterson at minus 165. So I'm expecting to see him, I don't know, 8,600 or so, 8,700 or so. Let's take a look. And uh, yeah, 8,700. So no real line value there. We'll take a look at the inside the distance prop. Now at 8,700, we're getting close to where you need to have that minus 110. Not quite. So I would say about, if you could get like plus 130 or so inside the distance on the favorite, I think you're probably in good shape. Let's take a look at what this is. Steven Peterson inside the distance is, yeah, it's plus like 200. So it's really, really not great. Uh, and the other thing is that he doesn't really have a lot of wrestling upside. So I think this might end up being our first kind of pass fight. Um, so you have Alexander inside of this plus 375. So I think this is probably our first pass fight. Um, so I don't like either of these guys, Peterson or Alexander, for deal. 
Um, moving on, we have uh, wait, did we miss was certified? Hold on. Wait. Well, I must have completely missed that. Sorry. I want to go back to CJ Vergara versus Daniel De Silva um, or Lacerda, however you want to, you know, you, you might see him as Lacerda or De Silva. Um, and I can't believe I missed this fight because this is one you really have to look at. So you have 9,300 versus 6,900. So he's for 9,300, I would expect to see, you know, minus 250, something like that, at least. Um, let's take a look and see what he is. Um, yeah, minus 275. So so it looks as though the, the line is pretty, pretty accurate. But let's look at the inside the distance prop. Now, here's the thing. For 9,300, what you're going to need is either first round KO, first round finish, or a truckload of wrestling, okay? Um, or both, you know what I mean? Like uh, first round with wrestling, you know, first round with takedowns and volume, all that stuff, that would be ideal. But if you get either a finish in the first round or you know, a wrestling-based second round knockout or a super-duper wrestling-based decision, I think that's what you're going to need. Now, Bergara is not a wrestler, so he's going to need to have, before we pull this up, an inside-the-distance prop of minus, say, 110, at least. Um, now, the good news is I think you're going to get it. Let's see. Yeah, so Bergara inside-the-distance is basically minus 200. So it's a very, very strong inside-the-distance prop. Um, the only thing I would say is that if you broke it down and let's, you know what? Hold on a minute. Let's, let's, let's break this down here. Let's pull up. Um, we're going to pull up the DraftKings sports book here. I want to show you something. If you broke it down by, um, uh, if you took just the first round prop, which is really what you need here. Let's see. Vergara. Round props. Vergara round one plus 120. All right, that's that's really good. You know, so basically he's about, well, he's not even money. They're offering you plus 120, so he's probably about plus 115 to actually do it. So 40% of the time he finishes him in the first round. Um, that's really strong. Okay, so that's obviously a really, really strong play from DraftKings. But that's what you have to do. You have to kind of really dig into it um, to make sure that it's not just the inside the distance. You, it's the inside the distance you want. Because, I mean, I've heard takes that, you know, Lacerda is going to, you know, win the first round and really go after it. And Vergara's best pass to victory is just to survive the first round and take over in the second I'll tell you that that might this might be his best path to victory, but it's not his best path to best path to victory in in DraftKings, okay? Because a second round finish is probably not going to do it. Um, so I do think that on the numbers, he is probably the you know the best play so to speak. But it, you are going to worry, you know, when 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 Lacerda comes after him and and Vergara employs that game plan, which is probably the right game plan to just kind of, you know, not go crazy in the first round, just let him let, let Lucerta tire out. That's going to be pretty bad for your draft teams. So it's something you really have to think about. Um, you, you have to play him with those numbers, but you know, I wouldn't go hundred percent of him or anything like that. The interesting um, component to this, to this fight is the Lacerda side. Okay. Because, Lacerda inside the distance himself is um is plus 300 okay and if you want to extrapolate that um to 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 um uh, first round I'll bet you that without pulling it up that a good amount of his wins in this uh in this fight are going to be in the first round um I would say 80% of his wins would be KO first rounds and then maybe 20% would be second round. So the, in either case, 
at 6,900, all of his wins are going to make the optimal. So the thing is, is that, yeah, he is only, you know, he's a plus, what is he, plus, let's see what we have here. He's plus uh, two, what, to win. He's plus 250 to win, but that but that's like a solid 30% of the time. So, I mean, if 30% of the time he's going to make the optimal, I mean, don't don't you want to play him? I mean, it's gross, and you're probably going to lose your lineups with him in it. But the times that you don't, I mean, you're 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 the nuts, or at least I wouldn't say a hundred percent of the time you you make the optimal. But but boy oh boy, you're gonna have to really work hard the rest of the card to not make the optimal. So unfortunately, you have to play, um, and and resign the fact that 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 lineup is going to get like zero, seventy percent of the time because he's never gonna like he has no floor. I mean, he's not going to score a lot of points in a decision or anything like that. You know, he's going to either get like 10 or he's going to get like 110. And that's kind of what you want. Um, so fortunately or unfortunately, you are going to play a bunch of him. And, uh, you know, look, and the numbers on Bergara, you certainly have to play. So this is obviously a key fight you're going to have to attack. All right, um, moving on. So we have Tucker Lutz versus Daniel Pineda. You have Tucker Lutz at minus 300. So we're expecting... You know, big, big price, 9,400-ish, something like that. And, uh, yeah, actually only 9,200. So, I mean, he's actually more favored to win than Vergara, who's more expensive. But I think by accident, they, they did a good job of pricing Vergara just because of his, you know, the KO upside he has compared to Lutz. They, I'm, trust me, DraftKings didn't factor that in, but they got lucky with that. So let's take a look at so Lutz, I think, is a very fair price at 9200 in, in general. But again, for 9200 what you're going to need is either a, a again, either minus 110 inside the distance or a, just, a, just a boatload of wrestling. Um, now, he doesn't really have the boatload of wrestling, so you're really going to need the minus 110 inside the distance. Let's take a look. You have Lutz inside the distance, and it's minus 110. So it's reasonable. Let's go. Is it as good of a play as as Vergara? No. But I'll tell you this, in your lineups where you play Lacerda, um, I think that Lutz is firmly in play uh, at minus 110. Um, now, I think that, again, I think the first round upside is not going to be that great for Lutz. Um, as a matter of fact, you want to go look, look through this? Let's go ahead. Let's go do this again. Um, like you'll compare it to Vergara for a second. Um, we'll look at UFC. Where are we? Um, Lutz versus Pineda, round prop. Yeah, him inside the distance. Of, well, it's plus 175. Hold on, I got to pause this. Sorry, so I was going to say, like, Tucker Lutz round one is plus 175. I mean, I wasn't expecting this. And we, we go back to, say, the other fight. Um, Go back to um, Vergara. Oops. That's really interesting. Vergara round one. Oh, he's plus 120. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's fine. Sorry about that. So, so Vergara round one's plus 125. Sorry, I waste your time there. Um, uh, so as I said, Lutz is a much worse play because of his round one prop is not nearly as strong as, as Vergara's. Um, but again, it's not bad. So if you're going to, if you can't find anything better, and you, especially in lineups where you either fade Vergara or you play Lacerda, for example, then I think that that Lutz is a decent alternative to try to capture that some of that first round upside, even though it's only like plus 180. Um, okay, moving on. Sorry about that. Uh, Albert Daria versus Chidi Injukani. In oh, by the way, so Pineda, 
at plus 230. I forgot to talk about him. Him inside the distance is pretty poor. Um, you know, plus 375. I guess he does have a little bit of wrestling upside, but but not enough to kind of overcome that. So I'm probably going to end up passing on the Pineda side. Um, okay. Well, am I going to complete, be completely passing? I'm, I'm going to say something there. I'm going to say it another way. Single entry, three max, 20 max. Yes. 150. I would, I would sprinkle him just, just, just because of variance. I mean, if he does get like a first round takedown and submission, which happens some amount of the time, you're going to want it at like no percent ownership. So um, I think it's okay in 150, but certainly not anything resembling a pro. All right, moving on. Uh, Enjuquani versus Jiraiya. Um, Okay, so Enjuquani is minus 165. So we're expecting, you know, something similar to the, you know, to the, um, to the Torres odds. You know, 8,500 to 7,700, something like that. Take a look and see what it is. Wow, he's 8,800. That's 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 pretty uh, troubling, actually. I mean, look at the difference here. So you have Enjaquani is 8,800. And compare him to, um, who did I say? Not Peterson. Um Torres, who's 8,500, their, their win odds are the same, right? Oh, actually, they're not exactly the same. So we're looking at best odds. So best odds may be about minus 160, 150-ish. And in Jaquani, more like 165. Okay, so this is fair enough. This is fair. And Jaquani may be a little bit juiced, but not that bad. All right, so not, not, not that. All right, um, let's look at the inside the distance prop. So when you when you are at eighty nine hundred, eighty eight hundred, again you almost want minus one ten. You don't really need minus one ten inside the distance, but almost um, maybe minus one thirty, uh, plus one plus one ten should do the trick. Plus one twenty, something like that. Let's take a look and see what he is, because the problem with him is that. He's going to be just pure striking. So you're really going to need that first round knockout, honestly. It, the very worst, the second round. Enjaquani inside the distance is pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's minus 110. Uh, it's similar to Tucker Lutz. And let's take a look again while we're doing this kind of analysis. Let's analyze it based on round one. Um. Did I, did I screw up the order here? All right, so Njaquani, round one. He's actually worse than Tucker Lutz, um, and he's cheaper. So this makes sense. So he's a, he's a pretty efficient. He's probably the same play, let's put it this way, as Tucker Lutz. Tucker Lutz is a little more expensive. He's a little more likely to finish in the first round. Okay, But what's interesting about this is that I think that Njaquani is going to be much more popular than um uh, than Tucker Lutz. Um so you could take that into consideration. I mean so I mean we're building these kind of like lineups here. I think that Tucker Lutz is probably given the ownership might be a better play than um than uh than Njaquani. Just given the ownership discount, because I feel as though that they're that the, the numbers are, are the same, you know, given their prices, I think Lutz is more likely to finish in the first round than Njaquani. He's and he's priced by pretty efficiently about the, uh, regarding that. So I think that Lutz is um, Lutz turning into a decent leverage play. We're going to see. Now, the other side of this is really interesting. So you have Daria. His inside the distance prop, I promise you, is is not much. Probably going to be probably plus 350. We'll take a look. Drive inside the distance is it's plus 300 when you factor in for vegan stuff, which is not great. But but he's got his path to victory is is wrestling base, right? That's really the only path to victory he has. 
So you're looking at a guy who's a plus 130-ish underdog, which means he's going to win about 40% of the time. And the times that he wins, I mean, I feel as though he's going to score. You know, he's he's not winning without multiple takedowns because, again, we listen, we, we, I spoke about this in the, in the intro. If you're going to be a wrestler, you know, and, and you're going to be reliant in some form on decisions, you're fighting an uphill battle here because of the way that judges have been awarding, you know, the benefit of the doubt to the strikers. But again, for the purposes of DraftKings, we're presuming that he's going to win, right? So of those, you know, all that stuff about the judges where it's been factored into the lines, if if you are presuming that if this is one of those 40% of the time that he wins, I find it hard to believe that he wins without getting the multiple takedowns and top control. You know what I mean? Not to mention that he's got some submissions in there also. I mean, let's look at his submission prop. You have uh, Jariah by submission by itself is plus 400, you know? So I would say 20% of the time, you know, you're, you're talking about both a takedown and the submission. You know, this is, um, I think this is a very, very live underdog. You know, considering, again, his win condition and considering also, you know, that I think the is going to be popular. I think that 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 Duraev alongside of Ogden are going to be like that's probably so far the two best underdogs, you know, um, and I think that Vidal can finally take a hike. Let's replace him with um, her with uh, something like Vergara for now. Again, we can't quite do this, but um, you know, you can do it. Look at this. Yeah, you know, like Giles put in Parsons. Remember, I thought they were like equal plays, right? Yeah, there you go. I'm not saying to play this, but we've got a bunch of fights to go to, but something you could do. All right. Um, moving on, we have Manel Cop versus Alex Perez. All right. Oh, wait. Sorry. So, so, Cop at minus 175. I'm expecting, you know, a price similar to Njaquani, maybe a little bit higher. So maybe at 9K, something like that. So I think Manel Cop at 9K is probably what, well, I don't know, 9K, you really expect to get like two to one. Um, Njaquani Enge, at 8,900 is seems like pretty expensive. Um, I don't know. So uh, in any case, uh, Cop should be probably, I think Cop should be more like 1800 Let's see what he, his price is. Cop is, yeah, Cop is fair. 88, 8900 something like that. So again, at this, uh, inside the distance, at this price, what you need is for a Cop to have, um, you know, about, oh, you know, perfect world, about a minus 110 inside the distance problem. If it's a little worse than that, that's fine too. Let's take a look. Manel Cop inside the distance is um, plus 100. I mean, nothing nothing wrong with that, right? Um, it's not exactly minus 110, but it's not it's not it's not bad. Does he have any wrestling upside? Um, I don't think he has any wrestling upside. That's that, that that's part of the problem here. Um, what is this? Hold on a second. That's, 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 this is not good. Right? Okay. Um, so he's probably more of a striker. He's probably not going to get any wrestling going. As a matter of fact, that would be coming from the other side. So I think Cop is reasonable. Now, again, since we've been doing this for all the other fighters, let, let's take a look at his round one prop because obviously that's what, that's what we really like. Let's see. So Cop in round one is plus 275. It's not that great, you know, um, and that's probably what you're going to need out of Cobb at 8,900. Um, can you get there round two? Yeah, but he's not exactly the biggest volume guy. So I think that he's just okay at 8,900. You know, I think he's no better than Njaquani. Um, As a matter of fact, Njaquani might be better. Let's see. Cop at two is plus two seventy five round one. 
And Njaquani, let's look at him round one. Let's go back to him. Njaquani round one is plus 225. So is, I think, is definitely a better play than um, Cop. And we didn't think Njaquani was that much of a lock. So I think it's interesting here. Um, the other thing that's, that's interesting is the other side of this fight. So Alex Perez is in a similar situation, I think, to, to Dariah. Not exactly the same. So Alex Perez is a very, you know, you know, he's getting a little bit of, you know, action. It's not like he's minus plus 500. He's plus 160. He expects to, you know, win the fight about 30% of the time or so. Um, and it's not exactly as dramatic as Dariah, but I do think that a, a good amount of the Perez wins are going to are going to be accompanied by takedowns and wrestling. Um, it's not as I think like mandatory as Dariah. So because I think Perez can win with leg kicks and and kind of a gruesome like terrible striking battle too. Um, you know, in case Cop decides to put in like very you know low volume and just and then next thing you know Perez gets a decision because they were anti per Cop because of his low volume or something like that. I think Perez can get part of his plus 160s out of scores that are not that great. So I don't think that he's as good of a play as Dariah, but I think that in, you know, one, you know, 50, 50 lineups and, and up, I think that Perez is live. Um, but again, as far as priorities go, I would not put Perez in place of Dariah as kind of our favorite underdogs. Right. Um, Moving on, we have Nate Landwehr versus Austin Lingo. So Landwehr is minus 220 20 or so. So we're going to have an, an over 9K, probably at 9,200, something like that. We'll take a look. It's 9,400. Um, 9,400's rough business, man. You know, you know, for for you to for you to pay off 9,400. I mean, you need it might not even be enough to finish in the first round. I mean, at 9,400, I mean, you need, I mean, you got to be probably like CJ Vargara to finish in the first round. I remember he was like plus 120 or something like that. So he's, for, for Landwehr to be competitive here against, say, Vergara play, he's got to be plus 120 or better in the first round. That's not, I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. We'll, we'll look at it in a second. Um, or you need a whole bunch of wrestling and volume, and I just don't know if that's, I mean, Landwehr, I guess he could opt to do that. So I guess he's sort of in play. But let's take a look at the inside the distance props. How am going to end up having to fade this thing? Let's take a look. Landwehr inside the distance. It's plus 160. Well, that's that's terrible for that price. You know, and, and God forbid we look at the in, at the first round. Um, let's take a look, but Landwehr. Round props. Plus 275. I guess it's not that bad. He's plus 275 inside the distance compared to... Um, let's go back to Lutz for a second. Lutz is plus 175 inside the distance and 200 less. You know, unfortunately, I, th I think Landwehr is just kind of a fade at that price. It's a little annoying. Um, but it is what it is, you know. He just does. I don't think he has the numbers to get there in ninety four hundred. Um, so on the other hand, you, you have Lingo, and the problem with Lingo is that he's literally he has nothing other than 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 boxing. You know, he doesn't have any wrestling. So his his wins, but, but the thing about it is though that his wins. Are going to be good enough, even even if their decision wins. I think it's sixty seven hundred. That's that's the only thing. Um, is that what he is? Sixty seven hundred, sixty eight hundred. So he is already he's like plus two hundred to win. So thirty three percent of the time he's going to win, or thirty percent of the time, and it's probably going to be good enough in those 30% of the times that he wins. It's not nearly as good of a play as say, as gross as this is as De Silva, right? 
they have basically, well, I, I guess De Silva's a little less likely to win, but not by much. Um, but De Silva's all of his wins make the optimal. You know, I don't think all of Lingo's wins make the optimal, but I think enough of Lingo's wins make the optimal that I think you probably have to play him. As a matter of fact, I play him probably before I play Landwehr. I mean, I know that I know that Lingo's 30 percent of the time he wins. I'm I'm almost not guaranteed, but I'm I'm pretty sure I'm in the optimal. But I think of the 70% of the time that that that, that Landwehr wins, I don't think it's it's remotely close. You know, I don't think that even 50% of the time he's in the optimal. So um I think Lingo is very reasonable here. And I play him before Land. Um, but I don't think either of them are priorities. Um so, but I definitely think that he's in play. Andrea Lee versus, uh, did I forget anything here? No, Andrea Lee versus Macy Barber. So Macy Barber is minus 285. So I'm presuming she's going to be, you know, plus 9,300, something like that. Um, let's take a look. Macy Barber is 90, only 9,100. I think it's pretty decent line value, you know, um, just to get the win. So I think that's actually not bad. I think it's actually a better, it's definitely better line value than say, let's look at, uh, to give you an example, you know, um, if it was just about the line, Barber's minus 275, Landwehr is minus like 220, and, and Landwehr is more expensive. I mean, I guess you, you could make up for that by having, you know, great inside the distance props, but um as you'll see i mean that's kind of the case like barber inside uh, the distance is plus 320 you know like for as most women's fights are um she does have some wrestling upside i guess um but i don't think enough to overcome the that very very poor inside the distance prop so i think that she's here's a good question is she a better play than landmere though I actually think she is because I think that her wrestling upside plus the just the lack of ownership that's going to come her way, um, maybe she's a better play than Landweer. But I don't think that she's a better play than Lutz. I don't think she's a better play than Bergara. So um, probably, again, MME only, uh, but single entry, three max, 20 max, Barber, no chance. And, and Andrea Lee, um, you know, she's going to win the fight 30% of the time. Uh, actually not even at plus 250 it's more like 25 percent of the time or well maybe 28 percent of the time but her but those 28 percent of the times don't always make the optimal you know it's going to be probably a boring striking based uh win for her um, if she wins so and her price is you know it's it's reasonable i guess 7100 but uh i i just don't think her win odds or i don't think she's as good as an underdog as some of these others you know like Duryev. Um, even, even Lacerda, Lacerda has got the same win odds as, as, as he's got better win odds than Ange, than Lee and all of Lacerda's wins make it, you know? So that's the thing. Like, if you're going to play any of these underdogs, you have to remember that, that Lacerda is the better play. He is the better cheapo than all the other cheapos. And he's probably going to lose like all the cheapos probably will. Like most of the, not to say all of them, all of them won't lose. Well, they might, but one of if you each one of them is probably good news. Right, anyway, um moving on, we just have a couple of more. We have and I said I'm sorry for this to be long, but I thought it was worth it. You have Holly Holm versus Yana Santos. So Holly Holm is minus 250 or so, um, with Vig minus 220. So I'm expecting 9200 ish something like that. And that's what you're getting. Uh, maybe a little bit better, 9K. So a little bit of line value. But again, you know what you need for 9K? You need either, you know, minus 110 or so inside the distance prop, plus be some decent round one stuff, or a great amount of wrestling upside. Now, you have her inside the distance prop is going to be probably really poor. I mean, she never finishes anybody. Home inside the distance plus 400. However, however, she does have a path to the optimal here through her wrestling. Um, this is what's become of her career 
You know, she was a big time boxer, knocked out Ronda Rousey and all that stuff. And in the last, you know, listen, she's 40, 40 plus, and she doesn't have the same boxing that she did, but she's developed this new style of, of clinching and wrestling and taking people down. And yes, it's more the straight clinching, but I will tell you something that if she can get on a roll, getting multiple takedowns and top control and, and God forbid she actually gets active with her top control. She can put up a number here. And not only that, but she could put up a number at very low ownership. I don't think anybody, I don't say anybody, but I think she's going to be extremely low owned. Um, number one, her inside the distance prop stinks. Number two, she's 40. And number three, every 9K woman fighter since the Eisenhower administration has busted. Okay. From Valentina, the outright loss, Juliana Miller, the outright loss, you know, every one of them has busted. Okay. So for people to go and play Holly Holm, who hasn't finished anybody in a hundred years, who is going to obviously just, just clinch and just try to grind out the boring decision. I don't think anybody in their right mind would play her, but I do think that there is a direct path for her to, score really really well um does it happen all the time no but i think that given her her ownership i think this is kind of my my kind of just stupid lose all your money gpp play of the week um is she, remember is she as good of a play as tucker lots nope is she as good a play as for certainly not is she a good of a play as any of these nine k's i i think that even you know maybe even in jaquani you know it, it might be a better play but Given that I think the ownership that's going to come in on, on her, I think that she's like, I think she has a hundred. I really do think she has 120 points. I think that she can get five, six takedowns, a whole bunch of top control. And God forbid she does that and gets like three a third round submission. That is the end of the slate. So I will be overweight on her. Um, it's not going to take much to get overweight on her. And that's going to be, listen, the, the, the great thing about it is I'm going to be dead by then, probably, um, in my lineups. So yeah, not going to have to worry too much about it. But if I'm not, I'm probably going to have a decent amount of her just for fun. So that's uh, that's that. Moving on to the final fight, the main event, you have Cody Sanhagen versus Marlon Vera. So again, uh, just to remind everybody, it is a five-round fight. And five-round fights are always mispriced on DraftKings. Um they, 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 they price them on a linear scale with fighters between 9,400 and say 6,800. They do not account for the, for, for more rounds. It's the equivalent of if there was a baseball game where the players were, were playing, um, what's the a similar ratio, like 30 innings, excuse me, not the seven, nine innings. Let's say they're playing 15 innings or something like that. And you could play the hitters for the same price as the hitters that are playing nine innings. I mean, wouldn't you want to do that? Right? I mean, you have more opportunities to score points. So, so in a similar way, the, the main event fights are, are really, really strong. And the other thing about it is that this particular fight is one that's going to benefit from the five rounds more than some of the others. Like you, you'll see sometimes these fights that are just big brawls that, they put for five rounds, giving the big brawls where, where somebody's going to rate to finish early five rounds doesn't really help. It's, 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 it's uh, chances because it probably was going to finish in the first three anyway, but these fights, the one that are, are not really rating to finish inside the distance. These are the ones that benefit from those five rounds. This is the one where you have these two strikers are going to go at it. And they're going to really, really benefit from five rounds of, of volume. Um, so I think that this fight is something that should not be ignored. Um, as far as the line goes, it's fair. You know, Sanhagen minus 170 is probably priced at about 8,500 or something like that. Um, yep, 8,600 versus 7,600 for Vera. There's no real line value there. And as far as styles and inside the distance I, I none of these neither of these guys rate to finish i mean we'll just take a look at it but you have um sand hagen by you know inside the distance is plus like 425 i will say that vera inside the distance is is shorter um he has more of the ko upside 
Um, so I guess you could argue that Vera is probably might be slightly the better DFS play, but I do think that because you know because it's five rounds, Sandhagen's going to benefit from the five rounds more than Vera. So I think that these guys are both just dead equal DraftKings plays. I would not like lock this fight in to my lineups, but I would definitely be with the field. I would say 35% of each of them just sort of is fine by me or 40% of you. It's just the numbers in a five round fight for this price is just too good to just think, I think, even though, listen, they're both going to be pretty high owned, but it's just, again, like what kind of ownership do you really want to give? What would you, what ownership would you give to Trout if he had 15 innings? Yeah, that's what you're dealing with here. Um, but not even that, because like baseball, like you could go over set six, whatever it is. Imagine on the other hand, let's say it's, since a striking base kind of predictable fight, what if you had an NBA team where you had a, you had a, you had a player who was going to get usage instead of playing 30 minutes, you knew he was going to play 49 minutes or something like that. I mean, like, it's like a joke. You'd be like hundred percent on. So in this particular uh, situation, I think it's kind of silly to fade these guys. Um, so I would say probably 40% of each 20% fade just for funsies, but it's kind of, I, I think that those numbers are pretty strong. So we've been through a lot uh, in this, in this breakdown. Um, I guess, I guess to kind of summarize, I mean, the only fight that I really faded completely was that Peterson fight. So obviously that's the one that's going to finish in the first round. Um, and again, as we went through this, like some of these plays that look really good at the beginning, like just kind of are falling off like this, the Dahl play and even this Al Tamarano play. And, you know, I, I think that the thing, my, what I'm going to stress here is that I think the Silva, you should, I hate to, I hate to like spend your money for you, but you should have him in 30% of your lineups. I, think. I really do because he's going to win 30% of the time and 30, I, 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 and, and he's going to be optimal those 30%. Um, and I do think that probably 50% should probably be from the other side. Um, just because of his inside the distance prop, but there are pivots, you know, you could play Tucker Lutz, like I mentioned, um, you could play uh, Holly Holm, God help you, you know, and that's going to be just so much solo. Um, Land weir. I just, I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm not going to get to him. It's not going to happen. Barber. Oh goodness. I just don't know if I can get there. You know, it's just, uh, but we'll see. And I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, it's going to be a really fun card uh, from a D from DraftKings perspective. We're going to do our betting breakdown in a few minutes, and uh, we'll see how it differs. Good luck, everybody.